there's a part of history that got lost. It didn't burn with the Library of Alexandria. It wasn't anything legendary that had a mysterious fate. It was the history written on the most ordinary paper for the most ordinary people. It's the history captured by newspapers, but forgotten by history books. For history books, remember the presidents, but forget the men. They remember the dates, but forget the life. This is where the papers come in, to build the world around history books. It's time to meet the little heroes we left out. This is the Forgotten History. A plane emerges from the clouds and in a slow spin is falling vertically to the ground. The speed is constantly increasing, the propeller is still slowly moving, but the engine is silent. The only thing that can be heard is the wind whistling along the body of the aircraft. It is falling straight down to us. Just a few more moments and the plane will crash into the ground at our feet, but then it suddenly breaks the fall and turns horizontal. The engine starts crackling with fury, its roaring swallows all other sounds, turning the world around us into a silent film. Window panes are rattling, the walls of buildings nearby echo the thunder of the mighty engine. Then, the plane draws a wide circle over the rooftops, nearly hitting antennas. It gets even lower and almost touches Rudzita's coffin. Later, when we are lowering the coffin into the grave, the plane is still circling above us, throwing one loop after another. Today, something like that is unimaginable and certainly would provoke public outrage. Such an audacious act would uh, hit the front page of all the major newspapers and would be the top story on any news channel. Of course, the author of these excessively juicy maneuvers, Kravtsov, who was a close friend of Rudzitis, was punished for this stunt. But I would like to emphasize that the key word here is excessively, because at the very core, this kind of behavior at the funeral of a warplane pilot, it was nothing extraordinary. It was just a common way to pay tribute to a fallen brother. You see, in the interwar Latvia, a funeral of a warplane pilot was always a big deal. All of these funerals got press coverage, both before and after the event. They were attended not only by relatives, fellow soldiers and high-ranking military officials, but also by masses of just ordinary people. After all, the Air Force held a special place in people's hearts. For example, the annual aviation festival in Spilve Aerodrome attracted many and almost left Riga empty, as some newspapers used to joke. And in general, these kind of aviation festivals were organized all over the country. As Latvians, we like to remind ourselves every now and then that the Freedom Monument was a joint effort of the whole nation, for which we all came together and donated 3 million lats. But there was a constant stream of fundraisers for our Air Force too, and in 1938, thanks to donations of more than 5 million lats, Latvia purchased 29 new warplanes. In short, aviation back then was very popular, and that includes saying goodbye to its heroes. Although it is logical to think that a pilot's last flight is the one in which he dies, the funerals of the Latvian aviators during the interwar period changed this notion. During this time, the funeral procession itself, the journey from the church to the pilot's final resting place in the cemetery, was called his last flight. And no, it was not just a beautiful metaphor to make a nice title for a newspaper article. The dead pilot did really take a symbolic last flight. By plane. Although he didn't fly it himself, no matter how much he would have wanted that. Because during this flight, he wasn't even in the cockpit. After being carried out of the church, the coffin with the dead pilot was placed on the back of a flower adorned plane, right between the cockpit and the tail. At this point, some of you will surely get uneasy with this mental picture and perhaps even deep concern will start ravaging your forehead. No, you shouldn't worry about the safety of the coffin in the headwind and crosswind and similar things like that. 
the plane did not have any plans to take off, even if the dead pilot had wanted to, because the wings had been removed. No, nothing to do with the metaphorical reference to the clipped wings. In this case, it was done for purely practical reasons. Not only to make more room around the plane for all the people who came to pay their respects, but also to make it easier to place the ladder to get the coffin up. Since the engine was not turned on, some other type of propulsion had to be used instead. Usually the horses were the ones to take on this important task to move the aircraft. The number of these animals varied from 2 to 5. It really depended on the funeral. But um, what was a bit strange in all of this, although uh, a standard for most funerals, was that the plane was always moving backwards, because it was dragged by the tail. It was simply more convenient that way. However, this humiliation of the flying rules was avoided in cases when the horsepowers were nowhere to be found. So then it was simply pushed by manpower, with the help of wooden poles put through the front wheel struts. Of course, as with any military funeral, it was impossible to do without the elements of the dead pilot's professional life. His coffin was decorated not only by flowers, but also by his dark flying helmet and the sword. Achievements of the battlefield were not forgotten either. Someone in the procession always carried the dead pilot's medals for everybody to see. For example, uh, the Order of Large Places. However, the brothers in arms, other pilots of the aviator's unit, were nowhere to be seen. Well, it could only seem so if you didn't bother to look up, because that's exactly where you would find them, in the skies, in their natural habitat. The dead pilot's mates pay their respects by attending his funeral flying their own aircraft. In most cases there were three planes in the skies, but sometimes the number was bigger. These pilots accompanied the funeral procession all the way to the cemetery, flying back and forth over the slowly moving column. It is important to mention though that no one tried to rip off the scalps of the people in the procession, as in the case I mentioned in the introduction, which by the way did not take place in Latvia but in Crimea. There, in 1924, a Soviet pilot of Latvian origin, Kazimierz Rudzidis, died when his glider hit a cliff. In Latvia, this tribute was paid in a slightly more restrained or, simply speaking, more Latvian way. And nobody did anything crazy and no one was punished. If the coffin had to be taken by train to the pilot's final resting place in another town, the planes escorted him only to the station. However, in the World War I, brothers in arms were prepared to do just about anything, to pay their respects to their fallen colleagues. The importance of the act is well described by a Latvian aviator, Rudolf Zalms, in the magazine Atput in 1940. He recalls that once Germans flew over the front line near Riga to uh, say farewell to their fellow servicemen. Despite the annoying barking of the Zenith artillery, their albatross circled over the city until it found the place where the people of Riga had gathered to hold the funeral for the enemies they had shut down the day before. Then, continuing to ignore the artillery fire, the Germans lowered the plane and dropped a funeral wreath, almost hitting a well nearby. Such floral tributes delivered from air were not commonplace in the interwar period, with the exception of the 1938 funeral of Tuoms Gailides, a pilot of ISARG organization who received such a farewell at the Forest Cemetery in Riga. The special tone of a pilot's funeral did not disappear when the funeral procession reached the cemetery. Here, as in any soldier's funeral, to simply lower the coffin into the grave was impossible. The custom dictated the traditional three rifle volleys over the grave, of course the usual pastor's speech and three handfuls of sand too. And then it was the time for the cross. But uh, for a pilot, two crossed wooden boards were simply not enough. Here too they had a special tradition. Instead of the usual cross, the tomb was decorated with two crossed propellers. The sight was quite impressive because of the sheer size of the propellers. This kind of cross stood out in the cemetery like a log among matchsticks, 
it was impossible to miss it and you wouldn't mistake it for anything else. However, in the early 1930s, this tradition was abandoned. The foundation for injured pilots came up with the idea of erecting standardized monuments for all pilots, and a little later, they were already commonplace in the Forest Cemetery in Riga and other cemeteries throughout Latvia. The monument depicts a block of rock and an eagle on top of it, with its uh, wings outstretched. In the center of the block you can see two crossed propellers. This way the sculptor, Janis Briedis, both preserved the already popular symbol and managed to play with the nickname the public used for the pilots, the Eagles. However, Briedis' idea was not exactly new, because eight years earlier a similar monument for the French aviator Manerol had already been designed by the sculptor Georges Barrault in France. The tradition of making standardized monuments for war pilots was not new either. The same custom existed also, for example, in uh, Lithuania. Their version, however, retained the propeller cross as the main element, placing it on top of a truncated pyramid. During the interwar period in Latvia, this special military honor at the funeral was given to about 40 Latvian pilots and also one foreign pilot. On the 4th of September 1924, the visiting Italian pilot Luigi Mainardi died in Spilva Aerodrome and five days later he received the same military honor as the local heroes. Of course, he was not buried in Latvia, but after a solemn funeral procession with a guard of honor, the coffin was sent by train to the aviators' native Italy. A more practical listener whose eyes are not blinded by the grandeur of this tradition will naturally have a question. But why did they crash so often? Surely it can't be normal. Of course it wasn't normal, the Latvian parliament was wondering about that too, which led to setting up a special committee to find out the cause behind his accidents. It turned out that there were three. Outdated British planes, insufficient training due to lack of fuel and alcohol. What an amazing tradition! But as every story, this one too came to an end. The spectacular funerals of the pilots disappeared with the occupation of Latvia in 1940. By the way, the last funeral in Riga to be held with military honor was that of a pilot. It took place on the 4th of June, less than two weeks before Soviet tanks arrived in Riga. Thank you for listening to The Forgotten History. To see some visual materials about this amazing tradition, visit my blog in Latvian. You can find the link in the description below. Till next time, take care.